The ways we help one another through activism, next on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation, smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA, keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Moortime Marketing and Communications, think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. We're here at the Clintonville Beachwold Community Resources Center where families in need can find help with shelter, food, and jobs. For over 45 years, the CRC has been a fixture in the community helping others. And if you're looking for volunteer opportunities, the CRC and all of the organizations featured in this episode are good places to spend your time. Our first story is about Nationwide Children's Hospital, a place that stands tall now, but it opened in the early 1890s with beds for just nine patients. This was a city that basically ran on coal, night and day, in its industries, in its houses, and so on. Massive amounts of coal dust were in the air constantly. There was a black cloud over the city most of the time. The coal got on your clothes, it got in your hair, and it got in your lungs. And a lot of young children were suffering from a variety of respiratory diseases, and local hospitals were having a trouble handling that. There was a group of women who realized that there were children in Franklin County who weren't getting the care they needed because their parents couldn't pay for it. So they went out and did the very first fundraiser. They went out and did a glorified bake sale, if you will, and raised $125 to begin the process of doing a children's hospital. What they really did was go talk to all their wealthy friends around town. And so by 1892, enough money had come into being to actually build a children's hospital. That initial hospital, opened by 1894, was located on the southwest corner of Franklin Park, with an initial seven children brought in to that house, essentially a two-story house. And over the course of the next few years, additions were going to be made to that house until you get up first to 70 patients, and then later as many as 150 patients. That building over on the park would serve Children's Hospital until early into the 20th century. And an entirely new building is built east of Parsons Avenue along Livingston Avenue. Children's grows tremendously over the period when it had seven initial patients on the one hand to as many as 10,000 going through in a given season these days. That growth takes place over a long period of time. It includes a variety of structures over the years. In fact, the original red brick building that was Children's in 1924 no longer exists. It's been replaced by the growth of newer buildings put on that same site. Now, Children's Hospitals had a long association with The Ohio State University, keeping in mind that the OSU Medical School came into being in its modern form in 1914. There were pediatric doctors at working at Children's Hospital on a part-time and a volunteer basis from 1914 on. It won't be, however, until the 1940s that a really strong seal is made between Ohio State University's medical school's pediatric department and Children's Hospital. In fact, the chief doctor at the hospital will also be the head of the pediatric part of the College of Medicine. 
and that arrangement remains from that point on. Over the years, it's been the wisdom of the board for the hospital to continue to be here in this community. We're very proud of the legacy, and we believe this is where we can serve uh, the greatest need by being in this central location. We all know that healing from addiction is a challenging process, and mothers have an extra burden of getting sober while caring for their children. A program called Amethyst is helping families stay together while moms get the help they need. Um, I didn't start using it until my oldest was five, so I had some experience of being a sober mother for a while, but I had a marriage go bad, um, and unfortunately I started doing drugs and I was not able to maintain being a parent. I mean, I started out here in the shelter, so I spent three months in the homeless shelter with my daughters before I got here. We can't do it by ourselves. Um, if we could, we would. There is so much power in asking for help. Um, I mean, I know for me, when I was rock bottom, I hit my knees. And I wasn't sure about no higher power at the time, but I needed somebody or something because I couldn't do it by myself. And this place offers that help. Amethyst is an intensive treatment program with housing attached to it. Our specialties are addiction therapy, mental health counseling. Uh, we also work with women who've experienced severe trauma, sexual abuse, physical abuse, and also victims of human trafficking. Well, Amethyst is the only program in Ohio that allows mothers and kids to stay together while mom is in treatment. And it's so critically important. What we've realized is women are not ready for treatment unless they feel safe and they know their kids are in a safe environment and their basic needs are met. I became unemployable. I became a mother that I did not want to be for my kids. I have small children that are six and seven. Um, I already have a teenager that's 17 that has seen me drink throughout her whole childhood. And it was just, it was about time for me. Um, I was literally tired. Trauma is a big class for me. Um, I didn't know that I, I didn't think that I had any trauma. I was one of those clients that when they got here, my childhood was great. I had both my parents. I wasn't abused. I didn't have any trauma. I didn't know very little things like a breakup could be traumas or miscarriages can be traumas. Things that I did not look at to be traumatic or traumatic. Once you've been addicted for decades upon decades, it's going to take longer than 90 days or 180 days. We really need that long-term program just to begin to tear down the walls. And really, we help women figure out why they picked up drugs and alcohol in the first place. What void are they trying to fill? What hole is there? What demon are they running from? What trauma are they trying to avoid? Because until they figure out that piece, they are not going to get to the point of long-term recovery. Certainly in a shorter-term program, they can abstain from drugs, but we strive for something more than that. We don't want just abstinence. We want long-term recovery. This program teaches you a lot of acceptance. Just accept who you are. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, you're not the only person in this world that's like that, and you're not going to be the last. And it took me being here this long, being with this many different women and people that care about you to tell you um, that you're not alone. And that's the best feeling because a lot of times I just would beat myself up because I couldn't understand why I can't stop. I can take care of my kids better. Um, it's still a struggle because it's my first time being a parent sober, um, but I'm learning how to do that as well. I mean, it's like the first time in 37 years that I'm actually happy. Happy with just being me, and it's awesome. And it's scary at first. I didn't want to trust anybody. I cried. I'm like, you guys don't want to help me. I'm nothing. But they did. Um, it's tremendous support. Like, the staff and the clients and 
the other mothers in the building make it so much easier to be here and to be a single parent. Um, they make you dig deep into those things that we don't like to talk about, but I have found that in order to heal from the things that have hurt so bad in my past is to get them back out and to work through them. Because obviously I wasn't doing that before by using drugs. So. I have amazing little girls and they get to see me be stronger. Like me and my 11 year old are going counseling. She has a counselor, I have a counselor. So we'll come home and be like, guess what I did today? You know, like we're growing together. Um, I don't, when I first got here, I didn't have a lot of self-esteem. So my 11 year old is kind of like that too. She stands behind me even though she's taller than me. And um, we're learning together. Like, you know, you look good today. Or do you know that mommy thinks you're beautiful? Or mom, you did a good job. Um, so we're growing together and that's really, really important because I'm not just recovering, they are too. It's a lot of work, but I drag them through my addiction. So I'm really glad to have them here working on recovery with me. I've got to get real close to a lot of the, the counselors and case aides here and they do amazing things. I know that they have helped me become the longer sober I ever have been and a better person. So. That's the kind of interaction I want. And I have taken a six year break from school. So I'm gonna go back to school and I'm gonna get a degree and I'm gonna keep going. I want my master's. Yeah, and, and this place has made it possible for sure. I don't have to limit myself anymore. It feels good. You know Ben Gelber as a longtime weatherman, but he's also the head of a local ensemble that brings Jewish and Yiddish music to senior centers. It's more than music that echoes through these halls, though. It's the rich cultural heritage that binds generations together. Well, my parents were uh, very big into classical music, especially my father used to play uh, uh, classical music uh, around uh, our bedtimes. I heard some at maybe a, a Friday night service, but I didn't pay that close attention to it until I had to uh, learn it for a bar mitzvah. You know, in your bar mitzvah, you essentially at age 13 become a junior rabbi, uh, for one time anyway, because you conduct the service, which means I had to sing. The Friday night service melodies, which I consider the traditional melodic minor, uh, always caught my ear because I thought they had an intrinsic uh, beauty um, and a very uh, almost angelic quality, as well as uh, the, the traditional spiritual. And so I wasn't so much listening to the, uh, uh, the words as much as I was in my head imagining the melodies and the chords. And I took some of that to the piano when I would dabble around between piano lessons. Uh, but there it sat for probably a couple of decades uh, until I began to conceive of creating uh, an ensemble that would lift these melodies beyond uh, just maybe what I would hear in a religious service uh, or even a, a Jewish wedding uh, and, and construct uh, all these different parts and layers, uh, add vocals and essentially bring out uh, what I consider some of the hidden beauty uh, in the melodies. It would have been around uh, 2010 where I became uh, interested in actually doing something with an idea which uh, I had conceived of which entailed taking some of these melodies and uh, bringing them into the mainstream and then a second time and then and then we come in with vocals. I found out my mom was uh, diagnosed with cancer and at the same time my father uh, was in the very early stages of uh, Alzheimer's. I knew a little bit about the, the concept of music therapy and Alzheimer's uh, disease in researching with regard to my father. However, I didn't really experience this until we performed at Wexner Heritage Village and I heard back from uh, the folks there after the concert that many of the residents were still singing and humming the melodies after we left. And that was the first inkling I had that this really is something important. Oh, 
We're playing National Church Residences at Mill Run, and this is where my dad stayed uh, before he passed away earlier this year. And I brought my uncle, who's 95, from New York to be with my dad during those final months, and he's here in the audience too. Very nice concert. I was singing along. <laughs> my parents liked music, and everybody in my family uh, played an instrument but me. And so I was always surrounded by some kind of music. Music um, really truly enriches our lives. It ties our, our memories um, into our long-term memory. We remember, you know, our, our first dance at our wedding, the songs we used to sing to our kids. Um, so all of that um, sensory connection just helps commit those memories to our long term. It's not about the performance, it's about bringing joy to folks and taking the music and making it portable. It's difficult, if not impossible, uh, as I would learn from my father's uh, extended care, you know, to go ever again to maybe a, a service or a wedding. So we can bring the music to uh, seniors, to memory care uh, residents. We played for about 50 Holocaust survivors and their families. That particular concert was especially emotional and there were a lot of tears, on, I think, on both sides. We actually have about 237 Holocaust survivors in Columbus. And they come from all over Europe, and they speak many different languages, um, from Russian, German, Hungarian, Romanian. So music really provides that unifying force. And then when you put in klezmer music, which is what Ben and his band Friday Night Live play, that is music from uh, this Yiddish and Hebrew music that they grew up with. So it brings back these pleasurable memories of a time before the war when they were with their families. I was born in Ukraine and it was time when nothing should be said about Jewish people. How they behave, tradition, all this stuff. It was forbidden. My grandfather had three passions in life, family, books, and music. And my dad inherited this from him. So that is my luck. It seems to me that it's changed person. Even if the person did not realize it, you know, because mus music evoked my memories, only good stuff. It evoked the best in the, my life. Well, I think every time we perform the melodies, you know, you think of your parents because they knew as well as anyone the core of all these melodies far better than I did. They understood the cultural aspects of all these melodies. I specifically chose traditional versions of the melodies uh, that represents their generation to honor them. It's kind of a, uh, a thank you, I think, for all that we uh, experienced and what was handed down through my uh, grandparents and to my parents and things that can kind of drift away if you don't wrap your arms around them and kind of bring them back. I prefer and I think that everyone is more enjoyable is sitting in the hall surrounded by community and listen to live sound of music I was so touched and influ influenced by uh, this music that, you know, in one moment, it's brought me back in time.
of us think of history as something that happened way back when, but curators at the Ohio History Connection are always on the lookout for history in the making. And in this political climate that spurs protest marches, you can find curators not far behind. Eric, how are you? Hey, Brent. Doing fine, thanks. How are you? I'm good. Uh, this isn't for the new clothing line you're opening in the gift store, is it? No, not, not, not that I'm aware of. Where the white gloves were a tip, you know, a giveaway, that means it's something valuable, right? Mm-hmm. What, what do we have here? So this is actually a hooded sweatshirt that was worn by Michelle Davis, a Columbus resident, at the 2017 Women's March on Washington. Uh -huh. And uh, there were a lot of Ohioans at that march, is that right? Definitely, yeah. Um, the march, which had an estimated attendance of between 400,000 and 600,000 people, had a really large turnout from Ohioans. In fact, it was uh, one of the top 10 states represented at the march. And uh, the march is a response to the, uh, the election of Donald Trump. Yeah, that's correct. And the, uh, the march itself, um, which was actually held the day after the presidential inauguration of Donald Trump, advocated for equality and rights of women, people of color, LGBTQ groups, people with disabilities, uh, and many others. Uh, but this is a historical society, and this is brand new. I mean, how old does something have to be before it's historical? Well, the way we see things, uh, history is really happening every day. We're all a part of it, so um, we certainly don't put restrictions on um, you know, historical significance of items. And um, as we've seen during this, uh, this election cycle, there is a lot of important historical topics coming up, so. And you collect items from all political ideologues or uh, both, both sides of an issue? Most definitely, yeah. We have uh, everything. We've re received pieces from the Women's March. We have um, pieces that we've received from the Republican National Convention held earlier this year in Cleveland. So we certainly don't pick and choose the, uh, the ideology that, that we include in our collections. Uh, tell me about the logo on this. This, is, uh, uh, this wasn't designed or it wasn't a custom design, correct? Well, this was the official logo of the uh, Women's March on Washington, and it's kind of neat because there's some local flair added into it by placing the official uh, national logo into the uh, outline of the state of Ohio, so. That's, that's really cool. And now tell us about this. Um, this phrase will be familiar to some people. Sure, so this is a, uh, this is a banner that Dina Mayorana, also a Columbus resident, carried with others at the Women's March earlier in January of 2017. President Trump, in a speech, uh, I believe in December of 2016, criticized the magazine for uh, changing the name of its honor from Man of the Year to the more gender-neutral uh, Person of the Year, although um, that's something that the magazine had actually done in um, years before. Not, it wasn't a new, new change for the magazine. The use of the different kinds of fabric reminds one of a quilt. Definitely, it's uh, it's kind of a, a neat handmade piece and it's a very cool addition to our collection because it has that handmade quality but it's also an important uh, object from a watershed political demonstration. And it turns out there's something on the other side too, correct? That's correct. Can we see that? Sure. So we can see a few uh, more messages which adorn the entire back of the banner and when Dina was uh, making this banner, she would share photos on social media, and soon friends and family started contacting her to see if they could include their messages and images. So um, it's kind of this neat crowdsourced uh, banner as well. So it's a, it's a personalized, includes personalized messages uh, along with the, with the banner. Correct. Well, it's terrific. It's interesting to, to learn that history doesn't have to be old or something doesn't have to be old to be significant. Yep. It's uh, exciting additions to the collection here, so. Thanks a lot, Eric. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all of our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app, and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods.
Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation, smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Wartime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State. Changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.